This is Dr. Dan Darko in his lecture series on the prison epistles. This is session number 18, Introduction to Ephesians. Welcome back to our Biblical Studies lecture series on prison epistles. We have been going through Philippians in the most recent uh, lessons that you have been following. I must say today, as we finish Philippians, we are reminded of the richness of this letter of Paul to a church which is based in a former Roman colony. I mentioned a great deal of the background to you so far. But if Paul were alive today, perhaps he may be happy for me to be able to help you recall some of the things he's saying in this letter before I submit his conclusions. Why? Because the letter was written to be read at a go, from beginning to the end. And so far, I have spent several hours trying to unpack what he wanted to be read, perhaps between 15 and 20 minutes or so. So let's look at some key elements at the beginning of this letter. In the early lectures, I reminded you that Paul was writing from prison, perhaps from Roman imprisonment. He was in prison because he was trying to advance the gospel and had run into serious problem as a result of his missionary work. In other words, those who imprisoned him were aiming to curtail or stop the mission that he so believed God had called him to accomplish. Namely, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul mentions in chapter 1, with a great deal of joy and excitement, even though from jail, that imprisonment has not seized the advancement of the gospel. And as if the church in Philippi may be discouraged about his experience, he goes on to draw the attention to the fact that his imprisonment is actually advancing the cause of the gospel. And in fact, the imperial guards who were actually guarding him are being reached by the gospel. And many people around him now know why he's in jail. In other words, if they thought they were going to hold him behind bars or in closed doors so that the gospel would not go forward, imprisonment had not stopped it. And beyond that, imprisonment had created opportunity for the advancement of the gospel. It is on that note he encouraged the Philippian church to keep steadfast in their focus on what Christ had called them to do. He challenged them to develop a mindset that is worthy of those who know Jesus Christ. It is in the context of attitude and mindset that he calls for unity in the church and asks the church to develop the mindset that is reflected or exemplified in Christ Jesus. Paul goes on to give us that beautiful peace that we call Christ him. And show how in obedience and humility, Christ accomplishes his work. In so doing, Paul goes on to call the church to task. He asked them to do all they could to stay united. And give examples of people who have kept this obedience and humility. And have developed that mindset and perhaps steadfastness, I should say, to be able to pursue the call of God. He mentioned his close colleague that he called son, Timothy. He mentioned Epaphroditus. He goes on to actually issue a stern warning about potential Judaizers who will come and cause commotion. And then on the basis of that saying, you know, these Judaizers, if they come, usually they come to boast about things of the flesh. And if anyone could do that, 
Who else could do more than him? He had all the rights and privileges to boast. He chooses not. Paul encourages the church to go on with this spirit of unity and focus. In the last lecture, I mentioned that you could read chapter 4 verse 1, in which Paul asked the church to stand firm as part of chapter 3, or going along with the end of chapter 3. If you read it that way, then it will end the way we ended our last lecture. But if you look at it as a beginning of a new chapter, it will read like this. You will see the first chapter, the chapter 4 and the first verse, actually saying, Because of what has gone on in the past, therefore, I am urging you to follow suit with this. And I'm going to end that statement with emphatic statement or admonition to stand firm. And if only you do that, then my joy will be fully complete. Consequently, he could now conclude knowing that if only they will stand firm, all things will be well. And reading further from verse 1 to the end of chapter 4, we can go on to say, yes, if they hold on firmly as Paul admonishes them, then they, they would get rid of any sense of disunity, confusion, and pursue the cause of Christ as he had brought forward in previous uh, chapters. Therefore then, when he says, My brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved, Paul is probably issuing a hink statement that is building, connecting the past and ushering us into what is forthcoming. With the central admonition, stand firm. Stand firm. In the face of or with the potential threat of false teachers, stand firm. With the pressures of the Roman colony of Philippi, stand firm. As far as unity in the church and developing the mindset, obedience, and humility that is required to make this work out, stand firm. It is then that if you read that, that verse that way, then you will see what Paul is going to give here as a general admonition from here on to challenge the church to get rid of some specific issues and address or pursue their personal challenges on a positive note. Paul, if you remembered, I showed you in the last lecture how in this general admonition he highlights the relationship, the sense of gratitude, and the fact that the church could be referred to as his joy and crown. And all this in the Lord. So far you may be tired of hearing again and again how much I refer to Paul talking about in Christ. Christ Jesus. For Christ. True Christ. One of his favorite expressions also is in the Lord, in the locus or realm where Christ is Lord. In the mastery domain of Christ, where he reigns with all his power, and where in his reign he provides the resources that is needed for the church to stand firm. Well, it is on this note that he will make specific appeal 
for unity. Because he had already mentioned earlier on the need for the church to be united. And I read from verse 2 and 3. I entreat Judea. I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help this woman who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Apparently, there are two women in the church who are not in good terms. Surprise, surprise, surprise. If you have been involved in church leadership of some sort, you say, this is what makes Philippians so real. Men leaders like to fight, backbite. You go to church council meetings and you feel as though one decision could not be made. The women leaders can, lead, can actually look cool and calm in the meeting. They leave the meeting and sometimes they are saying all kinds of nasty things behind each other's back. That is called church and church leadership. Apparently, that was true in Philippi. And two particular women who were worth mentioning, Judea and Syntyche, were not in good terms. Suffice to say, they were in loggerheads. They were not happy about each other. And it was affecting the church. So Paul appeals for unity in a church. He appeals for Judea and Syntyche to act responsibly. Why are these women single out? We'll have a look at that in a few moments. But it is quite likely that if they don't act responsibly, the ramification is huge. And can actually affect the entire church. Paul will literally entreat them to develop befitting mental attitude. A mindset that is appropriate for those who are in Christ. I mentioned to you earlier on how phronesis or mental attitude for Paul is important to conduct and how people conduct themselves. The way they think shape the way they conduct themselves with people. Paul is forefront in appealing to them not only to act responsibly, but specifically to develop appropriate mindset. Why? Because normally when people are fighting in the church, it is something linked to personal agenda. It is something linked to self or the flesh or personal interest. You might recall earlier on in this lecture series on Philippians, I mentioned to you how Paul challenges the church to develop a heavenly mindset. So as to make that shape the aware of life here and now. If this woman have actually got trapped or caught up into some self-ambition or self-agenda that is likely causing some problems for the local congregations, Paul said, I entreat you with clarity and firmness to develop the right mindset. And they should do so, not just for doing so. They should do so in the Lord. They should do so in the domain where Jesus is Lord. In the domain where both of them acknowledge the Lordship of Christ and submit themselves to the Lordship of Christ. In other words, in obedience to Christ, they should submit all their will, their desires, their ambitions, and develop the mental attitude worthy 
of those who call upon the name of the Lord. Develop the right mindset in the Lord. Wow. And as if these women are not able to help themselves, Paul appeals to a yoke fellow to help this woman. That is very interesting. He wants his yoke fellow to help these two women. I'll unpack some of those. But just for a minute, let's begin to look at who these women were. Judea and Syntyche. We have no further information in the New Testament or elsewhere in the Bible about these two women. So this is the only place we actually get to know anything about them. What seems to be clear is that they are singled out in this discussion and given some degree of prominence indicating that they are potential, they have potential influence to build or to hurt the church if they don't sort things out. Natural way of dealing with conflict and issues in churches will tell us that normally contentions like this are not only individual, but normally they come in cliques where strong personalities have followings and so they help to foster and feed into each other to cause more problems. So with all indication, we may be able to make a very good guess that these are prominent women who are actually the champions of some contentious issues in the church. Some scholars have identified one of them with Lydia. In the introduction of Philippians, I reminded you that one of the key figures who came to the Lord when Paul went to minister in Philippi was Lydia. And I also drew your attention from Luke's account in Acts that there were a lot of women who were ready to listen to Paul when he came to the city. And so some say maybe one of these women is actually Lydia. The Tubingen School, which has come to be discredited in most grounds because of the uh, extreme uh, liberal and highly speculative conclusions at some point, have also suggested that actually these are allegorical representations of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. So if Judea is a particular like a symbol representing Jewish Christians, then Syntyche will be, you know, kind of a representation for Gentile Christians. That is a very, very big move to actually arrive at that conclusion. So who are these two women? Answer. We don't know. Oh, my students hate that. How can you have PhD and say you don't know? Oh, yes. We don't know. We don't have any further evidence beyond what Philippians tells us about this woman. We can infer that they are leaders. We can infer that they had prominent standing in the church. We can infer so many things about their role. And clearly, they were prominent figures. That is all conjecture. And it's as close as we could be. Paul's point, though, is if they are going to stand firm in the church and they will stand firm in the Lord, then these women have to develop the right mindset in the Lord. And if they would develop the right mindset in the Lord, they will help accomplish the unity he so desires and wants to see in the church. But who is your fellow, you may ask? Paul talks about a yoke fellow that is supposed to help this woman. Who is the yoke fellow? Well, 
It seems that the yoke fellow is someone who is mutually known to Paul and the church at Philippi. It seems that this particular yoke fellow doesn't even need a mention in terms of name because people know him. Perhaps sometimes refer to him as, some people refer to him as, oh, Junior Paul. Hey, Paul's buddy. So, so maybe even that nickname is there that this guy is someone, people know that you see him, you see Paul. Who is that? We can say in the first place that the person was a known figure. And the person held enough respect in the congregations to be asked to help these women who were having problems. It could be Epaphroditus, it could be Luke, it could be whatever, but we don't know the name of this person. But we can only surmise that indeed there are, that this is a person that is known to all the parties involved. Some scholars have suggested that definitely this yoke fellow should be Timothy. Paul talks a lot about him. Well, that is a possibility. But that is just a conjecture. Some say it's Epaphroditus. Some say it's Silas. Silas was in jail with Paul. When they ran into trouble at Philippi. So it could be Silas. Some say, oh, it could be Luke. The physician that he named when he was writing to Colossians. Well, it is possible But still, we are in the field of conjecture when we think about this. One of the early church fathers called Clement of Alexandria actually says he thinks we should think about this yoke fellow in terms of Paul's wife. And this yoke fellow who is Paul's wife is most probably Lydia. That is very interesting. That will get you scratching your head. Because we we have been thinking about this and we've been trying to study and find out whether Paul was married or not. And by all indication, Paul was not married. Clement said, this yoke fellow, I mean, yoke fellow, I mean, somebody who is so linked, intertwined, almost one soul, one body, that's Paul's wife. And he thinks, would you think about Lydia? Oh, Paul is clever then. He's hiding that from us. No. Let me just caution you about something about Clement of Alexandria. In early biblical interpretation, we had two key church fathers that made significant influence in Alexandria and Egypt. Origin and Clement of Alexandria. In the late 2nd, 3rd century, going into the early 4th century, these are guys who influence theological reasoning, who influence interpretation of scripture, and who influence Christianity in significant ways. One of their methods of interpreting scripture It's important to note here before we take Clement seriously. Clement was known for what was called the allegorical interpretation of scripture. He and his colleague Origen will be actually literally be identified with allegorical interpretation of scripture. If you read what they have to say about some of the parables you may actually fall down laughing or you may scratch your head until you have no hair on your head. Because what they are able to find and see are remarkable. But in their view, as long as they are using the text to encourage people in their Christian life, they are fascinating thoughts and people should embrace them. And interestingly, even though they use that approach, their conclusions continue to still shape Christian thinking 
And often we quote them without even revisiting their approach to interpretation. Clement was an allegorical guy. And I would suggest that we don't take him too seriously here on his suggestion that Lydia was Paul's wife and the yoke fellow who is supposed to help Judea and Syntyche is actually Paul's wife, Lydia. That is a little bit too stretching. John Chrysostom, one of the Antiochian fathers, who would like to actually read the Bible and interpret it clearly, literally, in context, known as one of the best preachers, Bible expositors of his time. He suggested that the York fellow must be a husband or a brother of one of these women. For Chrysostom, that is a suggestion. Something for us to think about. Well, let's leave it as that. It's a suggestion. Because Chrysostom does not know. I'm giving you all this so that if you take any commentary that says, this is definitely Paul's wife, you know where it's coming from. This is the husband of one of the women, you know where it's coming from. May I even suggest to you that if indeed Chrysostom's suggestion is taken, that there is a potential bias in conflict resolution here, isn't it? If the person is one of them, is a husband or brother to one of them, is the other person going to trust that they are going to have a fair play in the way they deal with issues? That's something to think about. The Greek word I give you there, Suzugos, that is translated yoke fellow, has been understood and in modern scholarship is widely held as a proper name. So that means it must be somebody's name. And if it is somebody's name, then this is the yoke fellow is not a yoke fellow, but it's the name of somebody. The only problem that continues to leave this issue lingering is we don't have any evidence of a text, parchment, fragment that shows that name anywhere. So York Fellow becomes this issue here. But Paul's point here is not that we spend hours and minutes and pages trying to figure out who York Fellow is. Paul says, these women need to take personal responsibility themselves to develop the right mindset. And they need help. And he calls on a trustworthy person to help them. That is the key point being made here. It is with this framework, right after Paul had said, stand firm, that he will go on to issue this instruction. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Wow. So, after challenging this woman to bring peace and all that, he says, just in case some degree of anxiety or issues are causing, I want you to be able to take note of some key things. He calls and he actually says, rejoice. He called, just imagine. Oh, have those women sort the problems out. By the way, hey guys, chill out. Rejoice in the Lord. 
You know, even in the midst of something that looks like confusion and all that, don't panic and don't make it look like the world is crashing. Rejoice. But not just rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice as you find your place under the mastery of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just in case you do not get it, again I say, rejoice. Wow. Let me just point a few things out to you as we think about this passage. Lest I get too excited and spend more time than I should about this. Paul, in resuming this general admonition, calls for a seizing joy to be found among the people of God. In the Lord. Again, in the Lord. As you go through this studies with us in, on, on this uh, biblical studies lecture series on prison epistles, please take your time with all these books. Look for those words. In Christ. In the Lord. In Christ Jesus. And understand how important that is to Paul. In the Lord, rejoice. Let your gentleness. Oh yes. Those women may not be that gentle. They like to fight. Now by the way, gentleness here has nothing to do with going to the 5th Avenue in New York City and buying the most expensive dress and wearing them and getting the most flashy watch and necklace and just trying to show off. Well, it has nothing to do with clothing here. Gentleness in this sense has everything to do with attitude and conduct. Let your gentleness, let your social outlook reflect those who live their lives under the lordship of Christ. And by the way, it's not private. Let your gentleness be made known to all. Let people see the way you live your life and begin to realize that gentle spirit in you reflecting in gentle demeanor and gentle dealings with other people. Paul provides an incentive or motivation. You should let your gentleness be known to all because the Lord is near. This could have an eschatological connotation that says the Lord's coming is near or you are in the space where the Lord's presence is real. Let this be your way of life because the Lord is near. And whether it is eschatological or it has this immediate special connotation of The Lord's presence is here. The Lord is watching how you are behaving. Paul's point is, let your gentleness, people of God, be made known. Maybe you are beginning to think seriously about how much Paul refuses to present Christianity as this private affair. No, for Paul, the way we live our lives in this twisted and crooked world, should reflect and should make clear statement to them that those who have come to know the Lord hold to some higher moral standing. Their attitude, their conduct, their dealings with each other must be desired. That is why earlier in this letter he mentioned they should shine like light in the world. And then Paul will go on to talk about anxiety. Oh, anxiety is a big issue today. But Paul will say, now as you make your gentleness known to all people, overcome your anxiety with or by spiritual discipline. 
Let me try to read that in a minute. From verse 4 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be made known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Wow. Anxiety. Be anxious about nothing. Be anxious as you find your standing with God about nothing. That is not to say that as a Christian, there's never going to be a time where you feel as though things are not within your control. Yes, you are going to feel that. There are going to be potential to feel anxious. But Paul says, be anxious about nothing. Don't let, don't allow yourself to be trapped in anxiety. That word anxiety, Mary, now, also translates as worry. Don't let, don't become a perpetual warrior and trap yourself in the state of worrying about everything and everything seeming as though it's coming to crash, it's coming to destroy, everything around you seem like shaking and letting you get trapped with this fear and worry of what will happen if. Be anxious about nothing. Note that word. Be anxious about nothing. Zero. But in Everything, in all things, this is what you should do. Make your request known to God. Find a solace, a place with God, and talk to God. In all things, position yourself in the presence of God. And when you feel as though things are beyond your control, go to God in prayer. Tell him you feel out of control. Offer your prayers to God. Replace your request, your supplication with, with, to God. And Paul said, not and thanksgiving, but with thanksgiving, with the heart of gratitude, not with the heart of ungratefulness or entitlement. I sometimes have to catch myself coming before God in prayer and, and being so in a rush to tell God what my needs as if I am entitled to some things God should do to me. Paul says, pause, pause. Pause. Let your requests, let your prayers, let your supplications be made known to God with thanksgiving. With a sense of gratitude in your heart. Realizing that had not God been on your side, maybe things could have been worse. And let that attitude inform how you place your request. I've often heard people say, I'm angry at God. Because I wanted him to do X, Y, Z, and he didn't do it. But as human as we are, often we may feel that way. But in Paul's instruction here, what he seemed to be communicating to us is, we have to be careful about that attitude. If we came to God in the attitude of thanksgiving, placing our request before him, could we actually find ourselves in a place where we can gather some degree of audacity or pomposity to even tell God, you know what, you could be as big as what 
I am angry at you and I can pick up a fight with you. And guess who is going to lose? But in a heart of gratitude, we may come with humility. Imagine approaching someone asking for help when in your thoughts, in your heart, you are actually consumed or overwhelmed with a deep sense of gratitude of what that person has been or done to you. How would your next request to that person be put forward? Paul says, be anxious about nothing, but in everything or in all things. Approach God in prayer and supplication with that sense of gratitude. And if you do so, this is what is going to be the outcome. The result will be that the peace of God, the irony, the shalom, the total well-being that God alone can provide will be yours. And this peace of God is so great that it surpasses human understanding. It is peace that can be present in the midst of what seems to be impossible. It is peace that God can give in a context where one should actually, in the natural sense, feel so helpless and hopeless. It is that sense of peace that can make the person who is found on the deathbed become the strongest person to encourage those who visited them on the deathbed. The peace of God that surpasses, that blows human mind. Let me try to put it in American translation. The peace of God that blows the mind. Let that peace of God be the result. And in fact, that is a promise. That will be the result. If you came to God in your prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Look at the next word. Well, God. It's the, the expression there has some kind of a prison, military kind of thing there. God placing God post. Just imagine the peace of God building this wall around your heart and your mind and say, worry, anxiety, troubles, you cannot penetrate. You cannot consume the heart and the mind of this individual. Just imagine the peace of God enveloped, enveloping your heart, yourself, consuming you. Even in the midst of the most difficult time. As I said earlier in this lecture, it so reminds me of Psalm 23 verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. For me, that is what the peace of God can do. Because that peace will guard or will keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Your heart. In ancient Greek understanding, the seat of your emotion, the center of life. Your mind, the seat of reasoning, the center of your moral choices. He will guard, he will protect that for being infested or contaminated by all the pressures that are potential cause for anxiety. Wow. How often have we thought of that? Because with this military imagery, when I think about my heart and my mind, being guarded so that the difficulties, the horrors, the fears, the insecurities 
cannot consume me. I could find even a motivation to come to God. When the slightest sense of anxiety begin to creep in. Paul says, in a church at Philippi, as you maintain this unity and you make your gentleness known to all, be anxious about nothing. But in all things, come to God with gratitude and this will be the result. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. One writer put it this way. The way to be anxious about nothing is to be prayerful about everything. Wow. Before you started this lecture series with us, may I ask, had you thought about Paul and his prayer life in these terms? And maybe let's make it personal here. Have you actually thought about Christianity in such a personal way where prayer, gratitude, character, living at peace and in unity with brothers and sisters are so part of your life to the extent that when you feel as though you are getting caught with unexpected sense of fear and worry, you could come to God and find that peace. Yes, Irene may be right. The way to be anxious about nothing is to be prayerful about everything. And Paul will go on to write, finally, brothers, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is any worth, anything worthy of praise, Think about us. Let these things consume your mind. Think about these honorable, praiseworthy virtues. Let them consume your mind. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. I am tempted. I am tempted to spend a lot of time to talk about this test. But let me try to do something here in three minutes or two minutes. When you look at the things that he says you should think about, those are the things that actually are noteworthy, commendable, praiseworthy, of excellence, in a culture of honor and shame, these are honorable virtues, honorable qualities, things that society will look at and say, yes, these are stuff that are praiseworthy. Paul says, without naming specific things here and there, let these things and the pursuit of these things consume your thoughts. Mental Activity, cognitive activity. Christianity is not all about, I went to church and we clapped and danced and I left church and I felt good. I had my shot. I'm coming home and by next week it will be run out so I'll go back, I'll get to praise and dance, I'll hear a good sermon, I'll get full and then I'll come back, it will run out another week and I'll go back and get another shot. No. Paul says, For Christians in Philippi, the way they think is important. And their thought must be consumed with things that are honorable. Those are the things that will bring glory to God. And then look at what else he goes on to talk about after challenging them to think about the right things from verse 9. Learning. 
thinking, receiving. What you have learned. What you have received. What you have heard. And what you have seen in Paul. Practice them. Oh, it's not about theory. It's not about how many verses from the Bible I can cite. Practice them. Wow. I like that. But take note of this quickly. Get, lest I spend too much time as I'm trying to avoid. Paul appeals to shed, shed fictive kinship as he calls for moral excellence. He's clear. The thoughts cannot be empty. The thoughts cannot be filled with all kinds of filth. In fact, he says, when you come to God in prayer, your mind and your heart will be guarded. And let that mind think about these things. What you think about and what consumes your thought as honorable, add to that what you have heard, what you have received, what you have learned, and what you have seen in Paul, and put them into practice. Another promise. Verse 9b gives another promise. As you do that, guess what happened? And the God of peace will be with you. Wow. The God of peace will be with you. It's like the end of the prayer. Peace, 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 peace. And the God of peace will be with you. Having said all this, Paul is ready to bring the letter to a close. And so... He will present the thanksgiving and the final greetings. This thanksgiving from verse 10 to 20 is what some scholars think is a delayed thanksgiving. According to their view, if you follow Paul's pattern in letter writing, thanksgiving like this come earlier. And because Paul is bringing it to an end, that is why some scholars say, maybe that particular text doesn't belong here. It's probably a different letter that was brought in later. I explained to you at the beginning of the discussion on Philippians that we don't have much evidence or support to actually say there was any such letter circulating. So we treat this as one. Let's just look briefly about that Thanksgiving. This thanksgiving has been labeled as a thankless thank you. A veiled a veiled appreciation. And you may ask why? Because it's a thank you, but it doesn't really look like a thank you. Because that's how the text reads. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. But that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Is that how you say thank you to someone? Let's continue. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourself know that in the beginning of the gospel, 
When I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership koinonia with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied. Wow, is that how you say thank you? Having received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. So you see all kinds of sandwiching thing going on here. That is why scholars are not sure what is going on here with Paul. So take note of this. Commentators have different views about this particular uh, test and how sometimes it sounds like Paul is saying, thank you. Sometimes it sounds like he's saying, I didn't need your help anyway. So some commentators said here, Paul is actually showing that he's grateful for the care and concern of the church. Some say he probably did not expect the gifts. But the church ignored his request that he wanted to be independent in his ministry. And they sent him some gift. So he received it, but he was not very happy about it. Some say, oh, in the ancient culture, if you're true friends, you don't have to say too many thank yous when people do good. So Paul is trying to play that. That is actually quite, uh, I'm not sure how to put it, but that view is quite shaky. Some say Paul aims to redirect their focus to advancement of the gospel. And some say here, Paul attempts to balance appreciation and awareness that his mission is neither dependent nor motivated by their gift. That is the kind of position I lean towards. A colleague, Frank, puts it this way. This session is basically an expression of thanks to the Philippians for a monetary gift they sent to him through their messenger Epaphroditus. The note of appreciation appears in three places. In verse 10, where Paul speaks of his great joy because of the Philippians' expression of concern for him. In verse 14, where he tells them that it was good of them to help him in his affliction. In verse 18, where he uses both financial and cultic metaphors to describe the immense value of their gift for him. Paul, in effect, is saying this. He rejoices in the Lord for their care and concern. He is grateful for their gift and partnership. Their gift have supplied his needs. And he has learned how to live in abundance and scarcity. But he also wants to make it clear that indeed, he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. For Paul, he has learned to be content regardless of his circumstances. As you remember 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Content, Paul says, he did not actually need their gift to seek to actually survive. Neither did he even seek the gift. Yet he prays that God may replenish them bountifully. And I like that prayer. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ, in Jesus, in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. And his thanksgiving is as simple and very polite in these terms. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. 
All the saints greet you, especially those in Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And as we end this lecture, let me refresh your mind quickly with this image that I would like to make sure sticks with you. In this letter, some key themes have emerged. The theme of friendship and partnership. Joy and rejoicing in the face of suffering. Humility and obedience in the walk with Christ. Unity in the community. Kinship, being brothers and sisters in the family of God's household. And Christian models. Timothy, Epaphroditus, Paul, and above all, Christ. In closing, Paul's letter to Philippians has shown that imprisonment and obstacles have not been able to stop the advancement of the gospel. The gospel is been going on. The church must be encouraged and live in unity. As they tend to live in unity, they should develop the mindset that befits those who call upon the name of Christ. And as they develop this mindset, it is very important to heed to the fact that there are models they can follow. Christ being the first model clearly laid out. Timothy, Epaphroditus, Paul himself. And as they do that, they should actually make sure they develop that strong sense of unity. And for those specific two women, Judea and Syntyche, who are in no good terms in the church, they should take personal responsibility to work together. And the yoke fellow should help them. For the rest of the church, their gentleness should be known to everyone. And just in case there is still some degree of anxiety, let the church come to God in prayer with the sense of gratitude in their heart. And the peace of God will be real in their life. May I end by saying, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, be yours as well. Thank you for studying Philippians and all this collection of studies that we've been going through for prison epistles. Thank you for studying with us. And I hope you are growing and learning as I am. Thank you. This is Dr. Dan Darko in his lecture series on the prison epistles. This is session number 18, Introduction to Ephesians. Mm-hmm.